Hey, welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Guy Jeans. And today's guest is Michael Shin. And I met Michael uh, fly fishing with him. I, and I, I, he's, he's got some cool stuff going on. Um, I'm going to kind of do his introduction here. Michael Shin is a professor uh, at UCLA Department of Geography. He's a faculty affiliate in the Department of Statistics and faculty research affiliate at both the California Center for Population Research and the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. Michael is also faculty director of the UCLA Geospatial Initiative, which we're going to be talking about today, the mission of which is to meet the growing demand of geospatial analysis. As an expert in geospatial methods and techniques, this project draws from his love for the outdoors, fly fishing for trout, and concern about the climate crisis and its broader impacts. Um, kind of read a little bit about the golden trout. You know, he's going to be talking about what he's doing uh, up in the meadows in the high Sierra, but I'm going to talk a little bit. Um, the title of his uh, website is The Climate Change, Climate Crisis, and the California Golden Trout. And so it is no surprise that the golden trout is the official state fish of California. Despite its beauty, the future of the California golden trout is in question. Livestock grazing degrades the fragile native habitat of the state fish, while alien and invasive species like rainbow and brown trout hybridize with and prey upon the golden trout. I've seen that. Whether or not and for how long the golden trout can withstand the effects of other environmental stressors, climate change and climate crisis remains to be seen. And is the focus of this project. As one of the few native fish species in California, the golden trout is found in the subalpine region of the southern Sierra Nevada mountain range. Golden trout are found in the small and shallow streams of high elevation meadows. The water in these streams tend to be clear and cold and can fluctuate between 3 to 20 degrees Celsius in the summer months. The native habitat of the state fish is now contained in within golden trout wilderness of the Inyo National Forest. The golden trout wilderness encompasses 304,000 acres in an area known as the Kern Plateau at the southern end of the Sierra Nevada. The area is traversed by several hundred miles of scenic trails and two wild and scenic rivers, the north and south forks of the Kern River. The golden trout wilderness was designated by the Congress in 1978. The area is named after California's brightly colored state fish, which is native only to the waters of the golden trout wilderness. Now, without further ado, Michael Shin. Michael. Hey, guy. How's it going? It's going good, man. How are you been doing? Good, thanks. Especially after the uh, fly fishing with surf workshop. That was great. <laughs> so have you been back out there? I plan to go this week, actually. You know, it's uh, very relaxing and a, a challenge. So need to improve my casting. Awesome. We did a little bit of single haul and double hauling, get that, uh, yeah. that 250 grain line out there a little ways. And that was a lot Absolutely. of fun. Yeah. That was a blast. Yeah. And you know what, was. what was really cool, which I enjoyed was, you know, talking to you on the beach and, uh, finding out about what you do. And that just, you know, totally intrigues me. And I want to find out all about that. Um, but yeah, I'd like absolutely. to, I'd like to, um, you know, just have, uh, you talk a little bit about like who you are and, and what you do. And, um, if you wouldn't mind just starting with that, that'd be great. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I am currently a professor of geography at UCLA and I am responsible for teaching and research in the area of geographic information systems and geospatial science. You can think of it as mixing data with maps and the internet. So it's kind of like Google Earth on steroids or a multiple <laughs> layer uh -huh. Google Earth. I think maybe if you have some hunters out there, if you're familiar with Onyx, uh, that yeah. kind of technology. And so I kind of uh, figure out how to apply that technology as well as uh, develop the technology. So that's kind of where I'm at currently. And as you mentioned, I also do research. Uh, and one of the projects I'm working on is uh, on the habitat of the golden trout in the Southern Sierra. Awesome. I want to definitely get into that for sure. But first tell me, you know, how did you get into fly fishing? First of all, did you start young or did you 
just get into it? How, how did that go down? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a long-winded story, but I'll, uh, if you'll indulge me. Uh, yeah, so I grew up in uh, semi-rural northern Colorado, a little north of Denver. And growing up, I used to go fishing with my dad around Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, in terms of fly fishing, is mostly bubble fly fishing, so mm-hmm. nothing with like a long rod or anything like that. But yeah, that's just something that I was found very interesting. And when I'd go back home, I'd go to the local lake and fish for carp and bluegill with corn on my little uh, Zebcoat rod that I got at Sears. Sure. And then when I went to college, I went to college at CU in Boulder. Uh, a few of my roommates were fly fishermen and they decided, or they asked me to go with them. And that's kind of when I started picking it up and started tying my own flies. And it was really that time when I lived in Boulder, which was basically in the mountains that I'd go at least, you know, a couple times a month with a friend and we'd just travel around and go to the South Platte and, you know, fish in the winter all, all year round. And it was just the like, so when I finished my graduate school at Colorado, I moved to Miami. And as you can imagine, there's not a lot of mountains or uh, cold water streams. Uh, but I did discover that there was bone fishing for, uh, or there was fly fishing for bonefish. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't afford to go on any of those trips. But that's one of those things that's on my bucket list still. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I was in Miami for about three years, and then I came back out here to UCLA, and I've been here for the past 20 years. And I've been fishing on and off a little bit in the high Sierra, but not as much as I want to, but who does? Who fishes as much as they want to right. these days? <laughs> That's for sure. Um, but in one of the, uh, one of the you know, life's odd coincidences, I was helping a student out in the biology department who did research on grunion. And I'm sure you know grunion. Yeah. And how yeah. They come in at night along the beaches of Southern California. And so he's actually collects grunion and he examines the parasites that are associated with various grunion in different locations uh, in Southern California. And just, you know, he, well, he wanted to map the distribution of the parasites on the grunion. So that's why he asked me to get involved to help him kind of map these distributions. And then we got to talking and I told him I was very interested in fishing and trout. And I just got back from a, a trip to the high Sierra with my kids and I caught my first golden trout. And this was a cool five or six years ago. And then he encouraged me, he said, Oh, you should do a project. And I was like, thought about it for a while. And then I decided, you know, why nothing to lose during COVID. I decided, you know, now is the time to, to do what you want. So yeah. I started a project looking at the habitat of the golden trout. Um, nice. And so you, you started doing that and then basically, well, first of all, let me go back. So did, were you fishing yeah. the, the big Thompson? Exa- that's exactly where I was fishing. Oh, I love that stream. So it was, Man, it was right after the big Thompson flood in what that was nineteen seventy six, I believe. Uh-huh. Right. And then so I was fishing it with my dad, like where they put up the some of the their kind of dams to kind of slow the water down, I guess. Yeah. yeah. In those kind of tail waters. But you know, we use like a bubble and a fly on a spinning rod. And uh-huh. so that's how I got my start. <laughs> that's awesome. As you know the big Thompson. Yeah. Well they uh uh they did some uh, uh, competitions on the Big Thompson. I happened to be doing some, they had the competition on the Big Thompson, and then they also had some competition on the Platt and, okay. and at Decker's. Okay. Those, well, you know very well where I, yeah. I learned the trade. T- so super, very, te- very technical on the South Platte. Yeah, super tiny flies, man. Exactly. The, the, uh Size 20, 22 RS2s yes. that my eyes can't handle anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. It took me a little while. Like, you know, they, they when you do competition and stuff, they don't tell you anything really, and you got to kind of research and stuff. And it took me a few uh-huh. just to kind of figure out that they were eating those tiny, tiny flies, man. That was yeah. crazy. 
and they're yeah. pretty good sized fish in that Decker's area. Yeah, it gets, I mean, right now, I, I haven't been there in a couple of years, but it gets a lot of pressure these days. So Yeah, and um, we, we also fished a couple of lakes. Um, one was in the park for, um, I think it was a greenback cutthroat. Yep. Is that right? And, yep. Yeah, they were in this lake up there in uh, in the Rocky Mountain National Park. That was kind of cool. Yeah, they have some... Yeah, there's some cutthroat, some pretty big cutthroat in the high alpine lakes in Colorado. You got to kind of do the work to get up there. But, yeah, uh, there are some big ones in there. Yeah, that was yeah. that was a lot of fun. And then we fished in town um, below um, some dam. Like I think we were in Denver, and I think we we're we we're the plat the plat runs through Denver, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And we were fishing a dam below a dam, I think, and and in, in through town there. Have you you fished that much? That might have. Were you fishing the Blue River up in Dillon? No, it was. Um, I don't know. It was. It was, a, it was like I think it was a part of the plat. I'm not sure. Okay. Now, now I've kind of got got me guessing, but it, it could have been. It could have been in South Denver. Uh, yeah. yeah. In, uh, there's a canyon. Yes. Water Waterman. Waterman yes. Canyon. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Waterman yep. Canyon below. So is yep. that there's a dam? Yeah. Did you ever yeah. fish that? No. No. Okay, that was pretty cool too. Yeah. I mean, that was right in Metropolis, man. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and uh, but there was there was some trout in there. That was kind of fun. So, t- tell me, how did you get into you know basically doing this project? Was it from this um, this biologist, and you just kind of said, "Hey, I want to start doing doing this." Well, I mean, yeah, it's a couple of things in the sense that so you know a lot of my research uses this technology, and I'm interested in kind of the gadgets behind map making and things like that. Yeah. And up to this point in time in my professional career, I typically studied uh, political behavior and social socioeconomic patterns, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's voting or whether it's globalization and economics and things like that. And uh, during COVID in isolation and stuff, I just kind of realized I was getting a little too far detached from what I really enjoyed, which was being outside and doing some outdoorsy things. Mm-hmm. And I actually got a small grant to actually purchase uh, some uh, water temperature data loggers. So mm-hmm. I got 25 what are called data loggers, and they uh, monitor uh, stream temperature every, I haven't set up to take temperature every hour. And so I put those in. Uh, the streams up in the Southern Sierra mm-hmm. and um, they're recording the stream temperature as we speak because as you know water temperature is vital for the survival of any and all fish depending upon the range and you know there's a lot of factors that affect water temperature mm-hmm. so that's kind of what I'm uh, trying to understand is what factors influence water temperature and how does that influence ultimately uh, the life of a fish what uh, huh. what temperature are you, are you able to see the temperature right now up there no so I, oh. the, the way that the the original project I was going to go in there and I wanted to use a drone uh, to map what's called stream morphology or how the streams are changing mm-hmm. over time um, but as you know, you can't use any me- mechanized vehicles in right. the wilderness areas. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> I was I was working for about two years because the USGS was very interested in the project, and so they wanted to help me out. Yeah. Um, but and then California uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife they were also interested, but they're like, okay, there's certain limitations we have to work with, um, and we kind of landed at well, the most critical factor is water temperature. Mm-hmm. and kind of understanding at what scale water temperature changes mm-hmm. in meaning is it something that I mean it's highly localized or is it something that is constant you know for miles miles and miles which is clearly not right. so uh, this project is kind of a combination of looking at local variations in water temperature and integrating it with historical satellite data Mm -hmm. and then we can also look at snowfall information and then we can use the satellite imagery to look at what's called greenness Mm 
mm-hmm. or for example, when the meadows are green and uh, when they turn brown and the phenology or when, what time of year these changes occur to kind of link to uh, stream or water temperature. So that's kind of the science behind it. So um, what I've been noticing, you know, the, and I've, I talked to you a little bit about this, but you know, I've been fishing up in the, uh, the South Fork uh, current plateau uh-huh. for a long time. Yeah. And over the, over the years, I've seen a, a pretty good change up there as far as, um, you know, the, the livestock up there in some of the areas, um, has really, yep. has really damaged some of the, yes. the streams, you know, uh, yeah. the South Fork, uh, especially. And in what I'm seeing in, in a lot of that, in those areas is there's not a lot of deep water. It's all smashed down and there's not, not a lot of places where the fish can go. Yeah. And, um, I'm sure that that's having an effect on, water temperature as well because that heats up and then c- continues downstream is that right absolutely so mm-hmm. i mean that's you know at one level we can look at this as a you know a totally natural environmental challenge or problem mm-hmm. but truth be told you know blm has a range of ranchers for grazing mm-hmm. and in you know, these open spaces you know the cattle need water mm-hmm. and oftentimes when it's hot they're on the banks of the streams and on uh, some of the ponds mm-hmm. and they can create, as you, as you noted, tremendous amounts of damage. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, as the water gets more and more shallow, uh, and as the drought for any given year, any given time period, uh, increases in severity, uh, the water temperature will certainly go up and higher water temperatures are not good for, uh, any fish necessarily. So mm-hmm. for trout, it stunts their growth. And then also it affects the reproductive lifespan in the sense that, uh, they do not reproduce as much in warmer waters. Is that right? And it's, okay. Yeah. And, and it's been noted actually in the Southern Sierra that, uh, ranching and grazing has had a negative impact on the habitat. Yeah. There's uh, a, there's an area, uh, one particular area that, I know really well called Menachi Meadows uh-huh. and um, there's an area up there where they, they actually fence off um, a, yep. good, a good portion of the stream and it mm-hmm. is, and it is just like pristine, you know, there's undercut banks and just, you know, the plant life is just unbelievable all around the stream, you know, where they protected it. Yeah. And then downstream, of course, you know, it's just hammered, you know, with the, where the cattle have been uh, yep. on the stream and whatnot. And, um, I, I, I kind of raised a fuss, um, a couple of years back and took pictures and, um, had a little in, you know, to get some of the pictures to the, the head honchos at the, <laughs> at, yeah. the at the, uh, Inyo, uh, national forest. And, uh, uh-huh. and, and, you know, what's cool is, you know, you have, I guess there's a fine line and a balance, you know, there with, uh, ranchers and, and, you know, the, uh, environmental folks, you know, you have to, you kind of have to work together to kind of, kind of find a common ground. And, and, um, you know, they were, the ranchers were really cool. They actually put up fencing in some of the areas now that kind of keeps the the cattle from going into certain areas. And it actually uh-huh. is looking a lot better, you know, but, yeah. um, and they'll travel through those areas and get water and go to the other side of the meadow or whatever. But, yeah, you know, they are, they are doing a better job up there of, of, making the, the, uh, streams a little bit better, you know, but boy, before that it was getting, it was getting pretty bad. It was like a Sandy beach out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing with conservation. I mean, at one level, I don't think you'd find people more aware than the people that work with the land where the farmers or ranchers in terms of conservation, you know, yeah. I mean, it's not their intent necessarily yeah. to, to damage streams. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, we as you know, fishermen have a sure. particular interest in preserving what we like to do. And then you have, I know in Menachi Meadows, there's a lot, there's a lot of overlanders and yep. uh, four reeling types. And, you know, yeah. So it is a balance. Striking that balance is certainly getting more and more challenging. Yeah. Um, but I'm not one to be saying it has to be one way or another, but just increasing awareness. Like you, very, yeah. very few people know that 
cattle have a ne- very negative impact in high alpine meadows just because yeah. BLM has a- arrangements to lease the land for grazing. Right. You know, that very few people know that. So, uh, one of the, it's an important aspect. Absolutely. One of the things that, uh, you know, I, I like to do trips up into those areas and stuff, you know, as a guide and, mm-hmm. um, God, this is the last, I would say the last three years up there has just, I, I, it's gotten to the point where I'm like, I don't even go back, you know, for like, I'll be, go up there early in the spring to kind of catch some of the better water. But boy, by, by July this year, by the end of June, beginning of July, it was like already uh-huh. really bad as far as, you know, water flows and stuff. And those poor fish just sitting in the tiniest little amount of water, just trying to survive, you know, yeah. <laughs> it was terrible. Absolutely. This year. Uh, did you see that up in the high way up in the high country? Cause you're, you go up pretty, pretty high above yeah. that, right? Yeah. So, you know, I'm camping at 10,000, 11,000 feet. And, you know, as you know, these streams are in some areas two, three feet across and they're inches deep. Yeah. You know, at the headwaters of uh, golden trout Creek that, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, there's some areas that are six inches deep and that's, a deep portion. And yeah. so you, know, you stick your hand in there and it's warm. It's, it's, uh-huh. There's no, there's no, no refreshing quality, re- quality about it. But at the same time, you do see fish in these areas and that's what is surprising. But, uh, the state fish, the golden trout mm-hmm. is a species of concern. It's mm-hmm. not endangered yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, there are projections that, uh, say that it probably will not be alive for another, we have like 50 to 70 years, I believe. Really? Or, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And this is, this is the native habitat. I mean, I think people, when they hear golden trout, you know, it's been taken outside of that area yeah. and it does very well in Alpine lakes and in Wyoming, you know, they grow enormous, yeah. but in the native habitat, uh, just because of environmental changes and challenges, uh, they estimate, you know, like I said, 50 to 70 years wow. uh, before it goes extinct. Wow. So, so check this out, man. I'm up in, uh, I'm up in Menachee Meadows and it's like lunchtime huh? and I say to my clients, Hey, let's just, let's just uh, chill right here, you know, kind of in the shade and we'll, you know, sit on the bank here and, and check out, you know, the, the stream while we're eating lunch. And so we're all sitting there and we're eating our sandwiches and everything. And we're watching this little <laughs> golden trout, you know, probably about eight inches or so, you know, swimming there. Yeah. And, uh, all of a sudden out from underneath this undercut comes this big old brown trout and just annihilates that thing. <laughs> 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 and we're just like, Oh, cause you know, you, and you, we've caught them from time to time, you know? The big, the, yeah. they're big, you know, they're like four pounds or five pounds oh, yeah. and they live in those, those undercuts and they feed on yeah. golden trout. And that's just, you know, it's amazing, um, to see that for one, or just, uh, you know, be walking on the stream and then seeing, you know, this giant fish, um, for such a small stream, you know? Oh yeah. And, um, in the poor, the poor golden trout. They, they've got that issue. <laughs> exactly. They've got that issue of brown trout grubbing on them. And then they, and they also have, you know, the low water. Then they have rainbow trout coming in and hybridizing with them. Exactly. Um, yeah. So <laughs> they've got, they don't have uh, things looking too good for them, do they? No, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the whole thing is like, you know, the brown trout is a non-native fish. Mm-hmm. And then as you mentioned, the rainbow trout, they hybridize, so it's not a pure, I mean, it's depending upon, you know, how purebred you want your catch to be, I suppose. Yeah. And, right. um, uh, but you're, you're right. I mean, as the water gets warmer, uh, yeah. bass moving up in the Owens, for example, right. at higher and higher elevations. And that's, that's just a sign of, things to come, I think. Um, and so, you know, a full size pure golden trout in its native waters doesn't get much more than eight inches to begin with. Um, so if you're seeing larger fish in those waters and you probably won't find golden trout to begin with, but like you said, I mean, the, you know, it, it goes 
it dates back to the gold rush when, you know, people were bringing in these species of fish for sport. So Mm -hmm. we have a lot of brown trout in the American West. It's not just California. And then, like you said, the hybridization between different species. Mm -hmm. It it makes makes for great fun, and they produce beautiful fish. And a lot of the high alpine lakes, you know, you see some great, uh, great catches. Yeah, but at the same time, I think uh, the recently, I think they kind of want to go back and revert uh, or have some of the lakes back to their original condition, so they're not uh, uh, as, I, as I understand it. So, yeah. some of the lakes that have fish, they're going to be fishless in the future. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so the- I mean, again, it's a balance as to what the priority is and what you want in terms of or what the general population wants in terms of their uh, outdoor spaces. Like you want something pristine as it used to be, you know, like when the settlers came out, when a, when it first was, I mean, is there, yeah. what, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> is that your doggy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what does it mean to be truly natural? Right. Sure. Because I mean, like you said, it, you know, catching a brown trout is, great but yeah. it's really doesn't belong here if you if you go way back so right it's just one of those you yeah. know interesting even it, where does it end interesting you know um i went up with uh you know they've got uh, you've probably seen those barriers you know they have on the south fork of the current the what is it the schaefer barrier and then they have the templeton yeah. barriers you've heard of those yep. or, or seen them and you know, uh, I went up with the fishing game, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. And they wanted to, they wanted me to fish above the Schaefer barrier to find out like, you know, how many brown trout were above the Schaefer barrier, you know, and these barriers for people that don't know, they spent, you know, a lot of money to build these barriers. So the brown trout can't migrate up the stream yeah, and, um, and get up into the higher elevation areas. Right. Uh-huh. And so, um, you know, I go, we go above the Schaefer barrier, which is way upstream from, you know, Menachee, the actual Menachee uh-huh. Meadows. Yeah. And we hike up there and we, I hop in and I'm start fishing. First fish, brown trout. <laughs> next, <laughs> next trout, brown trout. Just unbelievable. Then maybe a golden trout, but it was just unbelievable how many brown trout were in that section. Now, if you go, if you go upstream from there to, and get to the Templeton barrier, you know, I've heard above that it's, it's much more um, uh, confined, you know, they're not, they're not getting above that barrier from what I understand it. What about, yeah. what have you seen any up that high where you, you've been? No, back I've only, there? I have only caught golden trout. I have only yeah. seen golden trout again. They're, yeah, they're relatively small. Um, yeah. but at the same time, I think to a certain extent, ecosystems are fairly resilient mm-hmm. in the sense that I, you know, when I was, I started fishing in Colorado. Uh, there was the whirling disease epidemic that just oh, yeah. decimated. I remember that. It just, yeah, it decimated rainbow trout. So there was like a, I want to say over a year period when I was fishing around Deckers, when I, I had never caught a rainbow trout. You know, it was, it was always brown trout. Huh. Um, and they attributed it to uh, whirling disease. And then, you know, at that time, uh, there was a lot of effort to educate anglers about, you know, making sure you rinse off your waders and boots and you don't use felt and things like that. And you don't transplant uh, the disease from watershed to watershed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as I understand it, because yeah. you know, there is such pressure on that particular uh, stream network, mm-hmm. you know, it's recovered. You know, you, you definitely can catch rainbow and big fish big fish now yeah. but at the same time it's you know again it goes back to how much management do you right. want uh, right. what makes it a natural experience you know i mean I'll, mm-hmm. everything is constructed to a certain degree and managed yeah. um and i'm not sure how if the public really understands the amount of work it takes to keep a fishery healthy and then what exactly healthy means right yeah absolutely you know the um I guess too, just kind of, you know, for your information, you know, fishing up in mm-hmm. the, up in that area, you know, the Menachee area, and just basically the South Fork of the Kern, let's say, um, yeah. 
there is uh there there still is a lot of golden trout you know but they're mixed in with like golden hybrid slash yeah. slash with brown trout as well in there right uh-huh. And then, um, so, you know, there are a lot of fish, but they don't, they don't, I'm not sure if they're like, you know, they, they all seem to not be like completely pure every once in a while you would, you'll see one that goes, Oh, that, you know, that one looks pure, but you know, you start, you start <laughs> yeah. seeing a lot of spots on them, you know, in other yeah. words, you know, on the ones yeah. down in that area, another interesting, another interesting thing. Um, and maybe you can, you know, shed light on this for me. There's a Creek that's a tributary to uh, the South Fork of the Kern. And this is crazy, right? So uh-huh. there's this creek that's a tributary to the South Fork of the Kern. And I love fishing. It's a little tiny stream, but it has uh, pure strain golden trout in it. And and with and doesn't have any brown trout in it or anything like that. Uh-huh. It's just this beautiful stream. And the last couple of years, it dries up completely, Right. Yeah. I mean, like, like dust, like you go into it and you're like, yeah. oh my God, it's just sand in here, you know? And then yeah. the, the next year you go back there in the spring and it's full of trout again. Yeah. And it, it you know, wild fish. And I, and I'm like, how does, how is that even possible? How does that, how does that even work? You know, it's, it's, un, yeah. it's unbelievable. You know, it's like, <laughs> how does that, it really how is. Does, I don't understand it, you know? And it's, it's always mind boggling to me because the stream is completely dry. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you go back there in the spring and usually it flows year round. Right. Yeah. And then you go back there in, in the spring and there's good flows and the fish are back. And it's like, what? And they're, you know, it's, <laughs> they don't stock it or anything. You know, it's all, it's no, all wild. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What do you think that is? Are they just swimming? No, yeah, they, I they, think they, the, the, the simplest explanation is, you know, life finds a way. <laughs> right? it, it, <laughs> in the it's sense that mind boggling to me. It is. It really yeah. is. Because I mean, I know in Menachee Meadows, like they have that endangered frog. Yeah. And it's, it's the same thing where, you know, a lot of these lowland areas and marshes will be completely dry at the end of the summer. Yeah. And they haven't seen the frog for a while. And then all of a sudden it, it reappears and then there's a new birth and re- regeneration. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's, you know, if you just think about how far salmon migrate, uh, oh, yeah. you know, on their spawning rooms, you know, right. You know, trout or salmon is, you kind of got to mm-hmm. think they've mm-hmm. made it, they survived this long. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you see the effort, uh, with which salmon travel upstream, right. Uh, to get to the spawning grounds, you know, I just imagine that the survival instinct in some of these fish, you know, as things get, as the temperature goes up, I'm sure there's certain signals yeah. that these fish take and they just, you know, in search of cooler water, they'll definitely travel higher. But yeah. if the head, if the headwaters are co- completely dry, you know, they're going to go down to, to yeah. the lake or to some holding pond or something. That's, yeah, you know. that's a good explanation for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, what's, what's also interesting is you get like completely dry, like at Ken- Kennedy Meadows, right? You know, where the, uh-huh. where, the yeah. bridge, where that bridge is there and mm-hmm. that you go there, you know, in the summertime with dust, completely dry, just nothing, yeah. you know, but downstream, downstream, you know, that you've got like, you know, these creeks coming in, Trout Creek and Machine Creek and all these different creeks that are like flowing all the time. You know, mm-hmm. and th- that makes sense. You know, they'll be down there, and then as the water gets bigger, they're going to migrate up for sure. Yeah, it's got to be what's yeah. going on, or they're holding. Yeah, and I have a lot. Of, yeah, yeah, I have colleagues. You know, that's their research specialty is groundwater, because I, mean, I think, as you know, when you go up to the high country and you see all these creeks and streams, like, and there's no snow on the mountains, you're thinking, "Where's all this water coming from?" Right, yeah. and a lot of it's. You know, if you can think about these high altitude meadows as giant sponges, yeah. and over over the years they've absorbed a lot of water, and you know they release it slowly, and it comes out in different places. But like you said, it's it's an amazing network and an amazing system mm-hmm. uh, that's at play here that helps you know all the wildlife survive. Yeah. Uh, although, as you also noted, it's getting drier and drier and I think it's going to get a little harder uh, moving forward. Yeah. Um, you know, I was trying to explain to my, my friends who's a, a non-believer in, uh, in climate change and uh-huh. all this, you know, you get those folks. Um, and you know, I always, you know, I, I, I look at, um, you know, like the, the, uh, the Southern Sierra 
And mm -hmm. what's crazy about the Southern Sierra is you can see what's going on with, with uh, the trees. The, exactly. the, the, pi the, yeah. pi the pine trees are just getting there. I mean, they're just dead all in, yeah. the, uh, all in the Southern Sierra. Um, I mean, it's throughout the whole Southern Sierra, a uh, whole Sierra, but I mean, in the Southern Sierra, especially it is unbelievable the amount yeah. of dead trees, you know, and in that, that darn, uh, bark beetle gets in there and, and just anni yep. anni annihilates them. And so, yeah. so my question is, are you, are you seeing this like all over the, the Sierra mountains as far as like things just getting drier and drier or, or all oh, over the West? It's all over the American West. Yeah. And the, I mean, it's all over the world actually, you know, yeah. whether or not uh, you believe it, I think, you know, maybe the question is, 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 you know, do you appreciate the current relationship you have with the wilderness and the outdoors right. and do you want to maintain it? Right. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think you know, I do and I want to preserve it. And yep. I, I love being outdoors. And so I'm going to do everything I can regardless of what's happening uh, to help it. And, you know, I think the number of fires that we see in the American West increasing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's a, like I said, it's a multifaceted issue. It's not completely, yeah. um, nature at work. I mean, it's part, partly management, right? Yeah. You go into some forest and they're super dense because, uh, we haven't let anything burn. Mm -hmm. So there's a balance between letting some things burn and, uh, foresting forestry, mm -hmm. uh, and not. So, I mean, there's, I, th I don't think it's useful to talk in either or type of, language yeah. if we kind of often get ourselves in in these debates either yeah. your way or the highway or my way or the highway you know that doesn't do anybody any good right some more of a I kind of try to take a more moderate and nuanced approach and think about hey I like to fish and <laughs> <laughs> you know if, yeah. you know, it kind of boils down to it's a selfish point of view but at the same yeah. time I think it's something everybody can relate to that you know there's something out there if you like to camp if you like to hike yeah, absolutely. I, um, you know, what's great, what's crazy is, um, you know, been doing, I've been, I've had my, my store, well, gosh, now it's going on, uh, 20, over 20 years. Right. And so mm -hmm. the change in the stream and, you know, I, of course I, I, I fished it, you know, the Kern and all that way before yeah. that as well, before I actually opened up a business and whatnot. So it's been longer than that. But just in the amount of time that I've actually, you know, had my my fly shop and guide service, just the amount of, um, you know, f the amount of fires that I've seen in that area is mind boggling. You know, just yeah. just in the Southern Sierra Range, I think I've seen yeah. every mountain burn at least yeah. once in that area and and across Lake Isabella as well. But the thing yeah. the thing is that's really interesting about that in the drought and um you know in 2000 in 2002 um you know we had this giant fire called the mcnally fire and it just uh -huh. do you remember that and it just that one i do not uh, it just burned and burned all the way up into the golden yeah. golden trout wilderness you know and and, <laughs> and then we had these record rains the next you know that next uh uh, that next fall, the next winter. Uh -huh. Right. And so all that black sediment and everything goes into the, the upper current. Yeah, exactly. And it was just a mess, you know, and the river got up to, I don't know, 35,000 cubic feet where it was almost hitting the, the Kernville bridge, you know, it was just unbelievable. Yeah. But I mean, it's just insane. You know, the amount of, of, uh, damage that is occurring in, in some of the, in some of the areas on a positive note though, you know, after everything cleared, all that sediment and everything turned into nice plants and, yeah, <laughs> you know, nice. Yeah, life, you know, yeah. life finds a way, right? It's, yeah, it's yeah. kind of, yeah. there's no absolute right, right or wrong way to right. address these things. I mean, that's the thing. I think, um, I'm sure Lake Isabella has <laughs> never been as low as it's oh been my recently. Oh, God. And that's, that's the thing, yeah. Yeah, I remember 20 years ago driving out around in the, that's a beautiful lake. And then you, yeah. it just gets lower and lower and lower. And it's like, wow. Well, we have this, crazy. we have this, uh, we, we got a double whammy, you know, we have the drought of course, but we also have, um, 
you know, the, the dam, you know, so they had to lower the water even lower, you know, to work on the dam. So they got a double whammy, you know, so they, yeah. so they had to make it even lower and it's, it's, you know, it's the low, the right now is the lowest I think I've ever seen it. It was like, I'm just yeah. like, Whoa, you know, you can see yeah. like the trees out in the middle of the lake and everything. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's pretty bad, but yeah. you know, what's, what's crazy, you know, since, uh, you know, I've, I've dealt with all these different, like, you know, fires and, and whatnot, it's really forced me to like go around and explore and, you know, fish some other fisheries and, you uh-huh. know, get, switch over to bass and, <laughs> you know, the, I don't know the, if I'm quite here that yeah, you got to try it, man. It's so awesome. <laughs> it's uh, the lower current bass. I, I, I'm, that, I'm all over that. That's my favorite. I love it. You know, the, the whole lower yeah, current was, bass thing. I think I was telling you about it, but, um, I enjoy well, that's it. part of the reason why I started fly fishing the surf, man. Yeah. You know, it's a little easier for me to access. I don't have to hike 12 miles in for one thing. Um, <laughs> <It's true. laughs> So, it's a so, little easier. So tell me about your, yeah, tell me about your hikes. You know, where do you start and, and, and how, where do you end okay. up and all that? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I need to start at uh, Horseshoe Meadow, Horseshoe Campground. Oh, yeah. Which is right off uh, due west of Lone Pine, pretty much. Uh-huh. You go up uh, Horseshoe Meadow Road. Mm. And there's a pack camp uh, as well. Um, but you can go into golden trout that's the eastern side of the golden trout wilderness yeah and so i, I hike up over cottonwood pass intersect with the uh, pct how is and then that go down. how is that hike going over that pass i've never done that, is that it's, pretty brutal? it's not bad uh-huh. well i mean it's all relative right yeah I mean, it's uh it's Depends if I'm carrying a sledgehammer or not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 50 pound pack. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's not bad. I mean, this is gorgeous. I, I just love it up there. That's the thing, you know. I was telling and, you, I think we were talking, you know, you should get one of those pack stations, bring in, bring in cooler and stuff, man. Absolutely. I think that's there. how I'm going to celebrate. <laughs> celebrate kind of like the final, yeah. final stage of the research and set up a camp for a week and just for totally... Sure go crazy and enjoy it. But it's, yeah, it's beautiful because it's, uh, you know, I go over Calvary Pass and drop down into Big Whitney Meadow. Yeah. And, you know, that meadow is just spectacular. And, very, you know, every now and then you'll run into a hiker or they'll run a, a trail camp for some tourists, but it's, it's really not visited that often. It's more of a throughway more than anything. Mm-hmm. Um and like I, as I mentioned, one of the things I want to do is hike from uh, Cottonwood Pass over to Forks of the Kern sometime. Absolutely, so that's, that's on the it. list. So yeah. when you when you hike over that Cottonwood Pass, and then you huh? come to Big Whitney Meadow, just over just over the hill there is isn't the South Fork right there, and you know a Tunnel Meadow. Are you kind of in that zone? No, I'm uh, north of that. So if you go, so oh, at okay. um, so out of uh, the horse campground at, at where you park your car, yeah. if you go do if you go due north, there's the Cottonwood Lakes Trailhead, yes. and that will take you the, the Cottonwood Lakes Network, which is beautiful. And that's actually where I got started the whole mm-hmm. thing, uh, camping up there. But if you go due west, that takes you over Cottonwood Pass, and then if you go south, you go to trail pass, which is above Menachee Meadow and things like that. So, and Tunnel Meadow is south of there. So okay. that's, that's I think, the area that you're probably more familiar with. So you would actually, uh, if you went down to the forks and stuff, you'd hike down Golden Trout Creek. Um, exactly. I'd go to Golden Trout Creek, go to the Little Whitney Meadow, and yeah. then Volcano Creek, and then it, you'd hit the bridge, uh, right. the Kern, I believe. So it's funny, yeah. I, was, I, you know, um, I used to be, hang out up in that zone a lot and, um, you know, in the, the big current there, but we would, we would actually ride horses up to little Whitney Meadow cause it's not too far from there uh-huh. and we would fish for golden trout in little Whitney Meadow. And, um, I'm gonna watch this, you guys, and I throw a leaf in there <laughs> <laughs> and the trout would just an, annihilate the leaf. You know, they're so hungry. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, we have a. The feeding season is so short. Yeah, right? yeah it's hilarious. So, but, but what a beautiful yeah, area, huh? Oh my god! So it is. I can't complain. It's it's great to be up there and and uh, 
get back to nature. But as you mentioned, I mean, the Southern Sierra is really overlooked, but it's really on the front lines of a lot of, you know, climate change because it's far enough south where it's getting hotter quicker. Mm-hmm. And it's where the drought is, you know, in some ways more intense than mm-hmm. the further north you go. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, mm-hmm. I don't think people really think of the Southern Sierra that much. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're always drawn to Yosemite and uh, the northern parts. So yeah. Eastern Sierra area. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, man. I, I love the Southern Sierra and just, uh, adore it so much i mean uh, uh, it's been amazing it's been an amazing place for, for oh, it's me, a for special sure. place yeah, yeah absolutely the you've got to get over there to the kern the big kern man in uh, the north fork there and just and check out all the fishing up there that's insane oh yeah i'll be i'll be, I'll be hitting you up definitely <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. asking you some questions at the very least you know uh <laughs> what's the what's the longest you've ever been in the wilderness with like not seeing a soul like like not talk to somebody have you ever has that ever happened to you Mm. recently maybe just like a two nights you know yeah but it's not like it's not i mean i was i always was close enough where i wasn't totally freaked out <laughs> <laughs> isn't it weird though it's it's trippy huh like i i had a um i had a three-day layover man in uh between uh pack trips one time and mm-hmm. I, and i was in the wilderness for three days by myself three, three days and three nights man and uh yeah this poor on the third day this poor hiker was coming through and i'm like, hey <laughs> how you doing you know just that human contact you know you gotta have Absolutely. it you know? and, and this poor guy is all hey man i'm good you know almost like it was crazy you know like <laughs> this poor guy i'm like where you going where you been hey <laughs> you know there's, there's quite a bit of traffic though in the southern sierra now especially yeah covid and the pct the popularity of the pct like when i yeah. go up uh, it's, I'm a little surprised actually. How many people the trails are fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but on any given weekend, uh, there's quite a few people out and like I hiked with me last year, two years ago, uh-huh. you know, and that was, a, that was a surprise at how many people were doing that, you know, that is good. and I, that, they have that lottery there too. So yeah, a lot of people like the, that hike to get up there on Mount Whitney, don't they? they yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta kick that off the box. That's right. So, <laughs> uh, what are you finding, if anything, uh, yet? Or are you, is it still just a study that you're doing? Are you find? Have you found anything um, that you can talk well, about the, it? Or this is a five year project, and mm-hmm. I am the, the data loggers are in there year round, mm-hmm. and I'm having them soak for through next summer, and then I'll go up and take some readings. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the meantime, I've been looking at, uh, satellite images, uh, like I said about um, snow yeah. as well as you know, the vegetation and the greenness and things are, you know, there is certainly a upward trend in the, uh, estimated temperature. I mean, it's, it's a trend, it's not, it's not, it's not, you know, terribly drastic or anything. Uh-huh. Um, but at the same time, at that altitude, you know, the, the variability in terms of temperature is uh, quite high. I'm mm-hmm. sure, as, if, as you know, when you go camping up there, the day it can be very warm and the night it can be very cold. Yeah. And then all the vegetation is exposed to ultraviolet radiation, so it stunts the growth. And, you know, there's a lot of mm. factors at play. Interesting. So... Right now, I'm just kind of trying to get my bearings and establish a baseline uh-huh. um, before uh, I collect uh, the data, temp- the the temperature data, and then hopefully I might expand it depending upon the results as well. So we'll see. Be to be determined. So stay tuned. Yeah, that's. Um, are you seeing? Um, or, or do you know? anything about the, uh, the snowpack for the next few years? I mean, any predictions or do you know anything about that? Stuff? Oh, no, I, I think no? that's, you just, you just don't know, you know, <laughs> they said, they said I was it was a, give me something positive. Yeah. Michael. I, I heard, I heard it. They, they, they said it's a La Nina year. So it's supposed to be a drier than oh, yeah. average winter, but we're off to a pretty good start. Uh, you know, we'll take, 
the small fronts that have come through recently, yeah, but it's yeah, nothing. We'll, we'll take it. Yeah. But I mean, like, it was like last year, if I recall up in Tahoe and man, once they got dumped on on Christmas, but that was it. Right. Yeah. There's this one big storm. So I think that's kind of the pattern from what I understand is you get big storms, but they're not as frequent. Yeah. So you kind of have to see, but I mean, that's, Neither here nor there. I think uh, all we can do is kind of hope at this point. <laughs> <laughs> if you had, uh, if, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions here. Yeah. If you had one last place to go fishing, where would it go? Where would you go? Oh man, one last place. Yeah, one last, you know, place to go cast your fly. Hmm. Or you haven't. It been might be in this. You know, it, it might it might actually be where I'm doing my study up in the uh, Big Whitney Meadow. Isn't that nice? I just, yeah, it's a special, beautiful. Yeah, it is a special place. It really is. Mm-hmm. It really is. That's cool. So uh, I usually end my podcast with a question about music. Ah, and I know you you and I are are roughly about the same age, so I'm yeah. I'm interested to hear this one. So okay, <laughs> so. Have you, uh, what have you been listening to, if anything, and uh, what do you, uh, what do you, what kind of music do you like, and what do you, yeah, what do you prefer to, to listen out there when you're cruising around? Well, my, my, my kids and my wife would say that I'm totally and hopelessly stuck in the 80s, which <laughs> I knew to it. a certain I degree I am. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I do like, uh, you know, alternative Sure. In the eighties music, uh-huh. certainly. Yep. Uh, I've kind of been getting into Beck recently. Oh, of course, yeah. Right. Uh, he's he kind of he's not eighties, but you know, he kind of stands. Yeah. He's yeah. a little later, early nineties. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, recently I've been like I've been enjoying learning about music. So on YouTube, uh-huh. there's a few channels that kind of you know, break down songs as what makes this song great or, you uh-huh. know, why is the Spotify top 10? Why do all the songs sound the same? <laughs> so I kind of trying to understand music in that, uh-huh. in that way, song which kind of yeah. makes it, uh-huh. exactly, which kind of confirms my, my bias towards the eighties that it was a great era for music. Yeah, for <laughs> and everything sure. reads, it sounds the same. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many, so many great bands that came out of the eighties, you know, and, and yeah. I just uh, pre, pre, pre eighties too, but uh, you know, nineties was pretty awesome too. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah. there's some good stuff coming in uh, nowadays too, but boy, sure. That, that eighties stuff is pretty awesome. <laughs> what about yourself? <laughs> oh, Are you the oh, same? I am. Oh my God. I, I, I love it all. <laughs> I love it all, but yeah. I'm really into, um, you know, it just depends on what mood I'm in. Like, you know, when, yeah. I, when I'm looking at I, this morning, I was kind of like going over uh, your stuff and what you're doing and everything. And I, I listen to like jazz piano, just kind of in the background, oh, there you go. You know, some of my Jamal, I, that's like some of my uh-huh. favorite. Um, and, uh, you know, then if I'm starting to get a little, you know, upbeat and stuff like that, I always love, love ska music. I play my, my band plays, oh, nice. plays ska music. Oh really? Uh, mm-hmm. The Stoneflies. Oh, check them out on YouTube, uh-huh. man. I yeah, yes. we got a we got a um, uh, couple videos and stuff. And check it out. And then uh, I dig the ska. Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah. We've got a horn section and stuff. I I bet you'll dig it because you like that eighty stuff. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, you know, I, I was just uh, watching some classic uh, Boingo Boingo and Danny Elfman on yeah. YouTube the other day. Absolutely. You know? And I just it's like wow, they don't do music like that anymore. Anybody, I mean, doesn't, it's kind of too risky or something, I think. So my, I don't know. So I'm, I have a guitar player, uh, in my band, his name's Mike Simpson. And he just went and saw, mm-hmm. saw Danny Elfman play at the Hollywood bowl. And he, pl- ah. uh, and he played, um, you know, his, his, uh, movie themes, you know, that he does, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like before Christmas, but he also yeah. played some Oingo Boingo stuff too in between. So it was like this show, you got this like orchestra and then you have Oingo yeah. Boingo and then he come out and do more orchestra stuff. And I thought that that was uh, so cool. really cool. I mean, yeah. what, a, what a cool show to go see. Yeah, definitely. So That's true. if you, if you, um, 
your your website is called uh, UCLA Trout dot net, right? Yep. And and are you accepting like um, uh, grants to keep this project going? Are you? Is there donations that people can do, or how does that work I, for, to keep this project? Going? I haven't yet. I okay. have not set up a GoFundMe or anything like that. I think yeah. you know that is something that I was considering, but at the same yeah. time. Uh, right now it's just been kind of a passion project for me. Okay. And so, um, but I mean, uh, based on some of the people I've talked to, based on our conversation, it's clear, you know, there's certainly interest and, you know, I think it'd be great to just get the word out there. And then, yeah. you know, depending upon interest and demand and things like that, I'm, you know, hopefully in the next couple of years, I'll have a report at the very least uh, to share and to post on the website where people can kind of see what's going on. And yeah, you know, I'm kind of torn. I'm sure you, you feel the same way about sharing information about spots. Sure. I mean, this isn't necessarily a fishing spot, yeah. but at the same time, I'm not sure it could handle a whole bunch of people sure. going up there. <laughs> yeah. you know? yeah. so it's, well, it's all those trade offs. I want to create awareness, but at the same time, it's, totally, uh, totally get it. Yeah. You know, um, absolutely. But, yeah, uh, currently, yeah, I don't have anything formal set up, but mm-hmm. I'm hoping to, as the project continues, uh, to keep this going on beyond uh, just the five years that I mentioned. Yeah. Well, on your website, um, you have all these cool um, links to all these um, articles about mm-hmm. um, all the different areas, um, you know, Montana, um, the, the Pacific Northwest on what's going yeah. on with the salmon. Um, yep. the, uh, the pup fish on the, um, on the Owens, uh, area. in the Owens. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, you know, the, the stream drying up over there and, and, uh, that dude literally saved the pup fish. That was an interesting article. Um, yeah. but, um, you know, you have all this really great information on there. So anybody listening out there, you know, go to UCLA trout.net and check out, uh, Michael's, uh, website and, um, Michael, thank you so much for uh, being on my podcast. That was a great podcast, man. I appreciate it. Thanks. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. And uh, let's great go fishing. Reconnect. Let's go fishing yeah, again. Yeah, definitely. Man. All Sounds right, good. I'll, I'll hit you up. Take care. Okay, buddy. Thanks, man. Yeah. Bye-bye. Uh-huh. Bye.